Yeah, you all came to hear one of the speakers, and we have a bonus tonight because uh, our main speaker is joined by another published author and uh, gentleman who happens to be director of global studies at the University in Albany. Uh, we're very pleased and grateful that he has come to join us and serve as the interlocutor for our uh, featured speaker. And I'd like at this time to ask you all to give a, give a hand to David Banks. The, the man that you came to hear this evening was born and raised in a Zionist family in Israel. He was educated in Israel, Japan, and the United States. He has shared with caring audiences like this one what he has lived and learned over the years. His father was a general rising to prominence in the Israeli military during the 1967 war. It was a, a horrific incident during the time that his father was military governor of Gaza that led him to become a nonviolent active activist for peace and justice. His son followed in his father's footsteps, became a member and leader in an elite military unit in the Israeli army. The tragic incident in Jerusalem turned him, led him, to becoming the ardent, articulate, advocate for equal rights that we're pleased to have with us tonight, Miko Pellet. And while we're thanking everyone, thank you to the uh, uh, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace for uh, um, uh, having me, as well as uh, Miko, and thank you again, yes, to the library for uh, uh, agree, uh, agreeing that free speech is, uh, is important, right? Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to meet you. Uh, a little uh, peek behind the curtain here is, well, there really was no curtain, is that we've never talked before, right? We, we've never met. So this will be uh, a very honest uh, dialogue of, I, uh, of uh, no, um, no questions have been pre-selected pre whatsoever, right? And I just want to start actually with uh, some recent events. The uh, Congress, the American Congress has uh, just um, passed a resolution that uh, equates anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, or quite the opposite. Uh, Anti-Zionism equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Uh, what, what, what do you think might be the consequences of that? And, and what uh, I would expect that you probably disagree with that, and if so, why? OK, everybody hear me OK? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. It's nice to see a full Turn house. It up. Speak up more? Yeah. As loud as you can, Miko. Okay, there's a mic right on me, so I can bring it up higher. I can bring it up higher. How about now? Right. I said it's nice to see a full house. It's good to be here in Bethlehem, a city named, of course, after a very important city in Palestine, the city of Bethlehem. A city of a city of great. <laughs> Oops, a city that has a great deal of significance. Oops. I'm right tight. All right, put on my tight. Okay. So anyway, so good to be here. Again, I, I echo what's been said about the host. Thank you for organizing this and the library for allowing the conversation to continue. I don't know, I can't imagine why in the world anybody would want to prevent this conversation from happening, particularly at a time when we see such uh, horrendous, horrendous violence being perpetuated against innocent civilians in Gaza, why we would not want to have this conversation at this time. Um, I understand, though, that people who support the violence and who support apartheid would have, would take issue with what I might have to say. 
and with revealing and, and delving deeper into the, the reasons and the rationale behind the racism and the violence that we're seeing against Palestinians. But that being said, that's not a reason not to have a conversation. So again, welcome everybody and, and thank you to the library for allowing this to take place. So um, the, the attempt to silence criticism and rejection of Zionism is not new. Zionists from the very beginning had a problem because they realized that their entire existence has, there has no legitimacy. Their claims um, that the Jewish, uh, f members of the Jewish faith, faith are somehow a nation like other nations, whereas Jews are united as a nation according to some of the greatest rabbis who ever lived, um, particularly Saadi Gaon, who lived in the 12th century in Baghdad and wrote that the Jews are a nation bound by their common faith. So Jews are not a nation like French or you know Italians or anything like that. But the Zionists tried to claim that, and we know that that is not true. Then they claimed that the Bible, the Old Testament, which is a book of faith, is a history book, which of course we know is not true. And finally they said Palestine is our promised land, which again is not true. So they came up with this, with this ideology that was based on lies and they continued to develop these myths and these lies and they had a problem because they needed, they needed legitimacy. And one of the tactics that they employed from the very early days all the way to today is to delegitimize anyone who challenged their, challenges their claims. So if you're Jewish and you uh, challenge their claims, as most Jewish people did when the Zionists were, when Zionism just started, um, and these were, this is before World War II, so there were millions of Jewish people in Europe and, and many Jews who lived in the Arab countries who rejected, who rejected Zionism completely. So if they're Jews who rejected Zionism or questioned Zionism, they were not real Jews. If these were non-Jews that rejected, then they were anti-Semites. So everybody was flawed except for the Zionists who came up with this uh, racist supremacist ideology, which of course we know led to the apartheid state, which is called Israel. The apartheid state that's been imposed on historic Palestine, and we know it's called Israel. Now, I don't think it's a secret that here uh, in the United States, and um, certainly in, in, in Europe and Western Europe, the Zionists have been hard at work for at least 100 years, promoting the idea of Zionism and promoting this, these, um, these stories that they made up and promoting, trying to promote legitimacy and create legitimacy for their own case. And they did it in a very comprehensive way. They came out with a very compelling story, particularly after World War II. And they've had a, as I say, for a very long time, a very compelling story and they had a very well-oiled well-funded PR machine, a public relations machine that has been promoting these ideas. And the Zionists learned very early on that, particularly in America, all politics is local. So they worked very heavily on local, on, on influencing politics, on influencing and having strong connections with media, influencing and having strong connections with uh, culturally, uh, in philanthropy, you know, I, I used to live in San Diego, one of the, you know, the biggest philanthropists in San Diego are the Jacobs family who own Qualcomm. Every library is, you know, so many libraries and schools have Jacobs buildings, they saved the San Diego Symphony, and they're a Zionist family. So now if you live in San Diego and you don't really know much about Palestine, but this wonderful family is a Zionist, how could you possibly not, how could you probably see any flaws in Zionism? So, that, so they did a very good job and they continue to do this. Now over the past few years they had a more serious problem because more and more people were realizing that Zionism has nothing to do with Judaism. And so in order to combat that, they came up with this notion to promote the idea that rejecting Zionism is anti-Semitic to the point where they came up with what they call a new working definition of anti-Semitism. 
which is known as the IHRA Working Definition, which they've been pushing through governmental and non-governmental organizations for years now. And universities and churches and, and local councils and cities and states and on and on and on have been accepting this new, adopting this new working definition of anti-Semitism, which basically, basically hints that if you are rejecting Zionism, then you are anti-Semitic. Now, to be quite honest and to be quite fair, there is no one presenting the other side. I mean, the Zionists have been hard at work for over 100 years. There's nobody, there's never been an organization, there's never been a body that has consistently, systemically, strategically been presenting the Palestinian case, the counter case, which of course relies on truth. So it's a much easier case to make, but it's never been made. So today, if American politicians want to make an informed decision, they can't. The Zionists have this very compelling story, the Jewish people back to their ancient homeland after 2,000 years, after the Holocaust, you know, it's very compelling, building this wonderful modern state of democracy and so on. And there's nobody presenting another, another story. And so there's no, well, there's no wonder that it's easy for them to campaign and get whatever it was, all but one, I think, uh, um, all but one members of Congress supporting this notion that somehow if you reject Zionism, you're anti-Semitic, which is absolutely absurd because Zionism, Zionism contravenes Jewish law. Zionism contravenes Jewish law. Jewish law prohibits Jews from sovereignty in the Holy Land, which is why ultra-Orthodox communities have historically rejected Zionism, and to this day, other than the ones who became settlers and became Zionists for all kinds of reasons I won't get into, you know, the, the, the ultra-Orthodox Jews are, are, um, are, uh, have rejected Zionism and, and, and reject the state of Israel, and many Jews who are not religious have rejected Zionism for other reasons, because it's a racist, supremacist ideology. Now, I, I don't think this has, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a bad move, of course. I think it's dangerous, but I think it's a sign of desperation. I think it's a sign of desperation. Jumping up and down and claiming that what you say is true doesn't make it true. Anyone who's had kids before has had a three-year-old jumping up and down swearing that they didn't do it. Well, we know you did it because we saw you do it. So Zionism is a racist, supremacist, settler colonial ideology that have, should have zero tolerance. Judaism is a faith. So to somehow claim that if you reject racism, violence, apartheid, and settler colonialism and supremacy, you're somehow racist and anti-Semitic is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, what are they gonna think of next? And the only thing that is even more ludicrous is the fact that you can have members of the United States House of Representatives nodding their head and says, yes, it makes perfect sense. If you reject racism, you must be anti-Semitic. If you reject the, 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 the genocidal policies that we've been seeing, especially now, passing it especially now, as we see the state of Israel's savagery, the brutality of murdering thousands and thousands of civilians, and now they come up with this resolution that rejecting that is anti-Semitic? It's, uh, what else can you say? How much crazier can you get? Why would a grown adults, educated people say yes to something like this? Intelligent. But, but the problem is that this is, excuse me, this is the reality that exists today, and there is no serious voice to counter that yet. Yeah, so uh, I, I want to get to eventually what that serious voice would sound like and what it would say. But first, I want you, you said the word apartheid several times. And uh, usually when, uh, you know, when, when apartheid comes up, I don't think everyone gets the full sense of exactly what the definition of that word means, especially with its connect, Israel's connection to South Africa and like what, uh, uh, um, apartheid really truly means as a, as, a, as a way of forming a state. Could you kind of elaborate on just the word uh, apartheid so that when people hear it in the future, they, they know everything it implies? 
What do you, or, well, apartheid. Uh, sure, I mean, there's a it's, uh, the apartheid is, has been has been has been designated as a crime against humanity. So the definition exists. It's very easy to find. Now, I'll, let me just just you know ex expand on that just a little bit. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. I was four years old or so when, when uh, uh, in 1967 when Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, was occupied. And suddenly, Jerusalem became a single city. Now, from that moment on, Jerusalem had two completely separate and segregated populations, as it does today. Israeli Jews who lived in privileged parts of the city, who had resources, who had nice schools and playgrounds and so forth, and the Arabs. We didn't say Palestinians in those days. And I remember as a child seeing the vast differences between what our neighborhoods look like and what their neighborhoods look like. As Israel is claiming that it is, you know, a united city and a united city and a united city, I remember being 12, 13 years old, looking around. I didn't know the word apartheid, of course, but there was something wrong here, completely wrong. So this, this, is, this is nothing new. Now, last year, Amnesty International came out with a report, an extended, detailed report, that concludes that the state of Israel has been engaged in the crime of apartheid since it was established. And again, I'll say this again, apartheid is designated as a crime against humanity. So three years after the Holocaust, three years after the genocide of the Jews in Europe ended, a state that claims it is a Jewish state engaged or was allowed to engage in a crime against humanity, and I'll take it one step further. Apartheid is only one of the crimes against humanity that this state was allowed to engage in. Ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity, which Israel, the, the Zionists of the state of Israel has been uh, in which the side of Israel, the state of Israel has been engaged, and genocide. And people say, oh my God, genocide. Well, look at the definition of these laws, compare them to what has been going on in Palestine since the state of Israel was established, and you, you, know, you figure it out. It's very easy to see. Now, if you're going to establish a state for Jewish people in an Arab country, in a predominantly Muslim country, they will be the state for Jews. The only way to do it is through ethnic cleansing, genocide of the non-Jews, ethnic cleansing, of course, uh, uh, perpetrated against the non-Jews, and establishing an apartheid state because you still have Palestinians who live there. So the only way you can create a state where Jewish people are privileged is an apartheid state where there's, a, there's, there's, there's state legalized racism, segregation between the, two, between the two populations. I believe we said the questions were gonna be later. And so, and so today, we have a reality where Israelis live in these you know, in these spheres of privilege, minority, by the way, Israelis are the minority of the population today in historic Palestine, among a majority of Palestinians who do not enjoy the same privileges, those same rights. And we can talk later, if you want, about the differences between the kind of bureaucracies that lead, the, that under which Palestinians have to lead their lives, because it's different bureaucracies. Jews live under the same set of laws, regardless of where they live throughout the country. Palestinians, are governed by different laws depending on where they live specifically within uh, within historic Palestine. You know, let's, let's get to that now, actually. Sure. Yeah, okay. Let's do that. Right. Yeah. It's like uh, whenever there is like a, um, an incursion into into Gaza, whatever you know, something um, uh, big happens. Uh, you know, you do get a glimpse, if ever so filtered, of like what the lives of, of yeah. Palestinians yeah. in the Gaza Strip, and you hear the words "open air prison," etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are people who who, uh, who are uh, um, non non Jews that do not live 
in in Gaza or or, or the West Bank. So, like, what could you go through? Like, what are the different yeah. sorts of, of lives that that a non-Jew would live in what is the borders of what is currently considered yeah. Israel? Yeah. So, uh, and again, I'll refer you back, and I strongly, strongly recommend that everybody go home today and look up, bring up the amnesty report and apartheid so you can see what they're talking about. It's very detailed. It took them several years to put together. It's, uh, it's, it's extremely important for people to know so when we use these words, we know what we're talking about. And, um, and the details, you know, to understand the details of how this apartheid regime has been operating for, you know, 75 years. Um, and if you can't, if you don't like reading, if you can't read 200 pages or whatever, however long it is, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, you can read the summary. But I strongly recommend uh, that you read it, print it, and then give it to your friends. It's a very, very important uh, thing. Now, so... Israel created several different bureaucracies to govern Palestinians throughout historic Palestine. Let's start with the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Today, there are about two million Palestinian citizens of Israel. Now, so their citizenship looks nothing like the citizenship of Israeli Jews. Nothing at all in terms of resources, in terms of rights, in terms of uh, uh, job opportunities, opportunities to go to school, travel. The life of Palestinians is a life of terror. It's a life of terror, of everyday terror. They know that they can be killed and there will be no consequences. They know that they can be put in jail, there will be no consequences, there's no recourse. Now within 1948 Palestine, which is also known as pre-1967 Israel, it's got all kinds of names, it's basically 1948 Palestine. You have the entire southern part of Palestine, which is called the Nakab. The Nakab, which is almost 50%, or more than 50% of historic Palestine. That's where the Palestinian Bedouin reside. Today there are about 300,000 Palestinian Bedouin who reside in the Nakab. They are governed by a bureaucracy which is called the Agency for the Development of the Negev. The Negev is the Hebrew name for Nakab. And basically, that bureaucracy's job is to make is to is to push Palestinian Bedouin off their lands, whatever little land they still are allowed to maintain, and they have their own law enforcement and um, home demolition uh, process, and so on. And while Israelis living in Israeli settlements in the Nakab enjoy some of the highest standards of living among Israelis. The poorest of the poor among Israeli citizens are the Bedouin in the Nakab. And we're talking about a kind of poverty where there are no roads, no access to medical care, no access to water, and no access to electricity. That's the kind of discrimination we're talking about. So that's the southern part of, of, of Palestine. Almost 50%, or about 50% of Palestine is the Nakab. And it's a desert, but it's a very fertile desert. It's a desert, a desert that's relatively rich in water, so it's very good agricultural land. But the Palestinian Bedouin, who are traditionally farmers and cultivated the land, are prohibited from cultivating and are prohibited from engaging in farming. If I went back tomorrow, I could get a ranch and I could begin. I'd be subsidized, the water would be subsidized, the land would be subsidized, and I could do whatever farming I wanted. A Palestinian Bedouin whose land this was are prohibited from farming. Over the, la you know, over the last uh, five or so years, five, six years at least, there have been close to 2,500 home demolitions in the Nakab alone. How many of those? So about 10,000 homes demolished in, in about four or five years. How many of those would you guess are homes of Israeli Jews? Oh, zero. Ten thousand. Nothing. Zero. 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 So is it possible that only Palestinians build without a permit? Is it because that's usually the excuse? Is it possible that only Palestinians violate the building uh, building guidelines and building uh, laws? Is it possible? I know Israelis who build without a permit, who added a balcony 
who closed the whatever, closed the balcony, added a room, whatever. No, it doesn't make sense. But that's the reality. You never see, you know, if an Israeli builds without a permit, they get a fine, they get a report, uh, an inspector comes, they go to trial in a few years, they, well, you know. You never see the army close down the street and demolish the home. That never happens. And now on top of that, they just passed a law a couple of months ago that on top of the demolition, they also stopped their water supply, stopped their electricity supply, and stopped their phone service as punishment. Now that's just the southern part. The rest of the country, the northern part, they live under a different set of laws. Then you've got, and there are some 40,000 home demolition orders, and I'm just talking about home demolition as one aspect home demolition orders for Palestinians in the northern part of Palestine, without Jerusalem, without the West Bank. I'm only talking about 1948 Palestine, where citizens of Israel live. You can buy a gun, shoot someone in a Palestinian town in any part of 1948, and no, the police will never come. They will never come. Then you have the Palestinians who live in what used to be the West Bank. There used to be thing, this thing called the West Bank. It no longer exists. Israel has built heavily in there. It's completely been integrated into the state of Israel, except for what they call, what they define as, large pockets of alien populations. That's some three and a half million Palestinians living in ghettos. And again, according to the, the definition, the Israeli definition, these are large pockets of an alien population. See, the indigenous people are not the aliens. They're the alien population. Some three and a half million people. And they live under a strict military law. They have no rights whatsoever. Once again, they can be shot, they can be killed, they don't, you know. They have even less recourse than the little recourse that Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, have, even if it's only, even if it's only uh, formality. Then we have the, the Gaza Strip, like you said, which is an open-air prison. And then actually there's also Palestinians who live on the outside in refugee camps, languishing because they're not permitted, Israeli law does not permit them to return. Some six million Palestinians living in refugee camps, languishing in camps, only because Israel denies them the right to go back home. And then there's one other important issue, I know you have other questions, and that is the issue of water. All of the water throughout the entire country is governed by an Israeli agency called Mikorot. You may have heard of it. And Mikorot likes to export its, export its expertise in what they call making the desert bloom, which we should talk about also, this idea. But anyway, Mikorot governs all the water and allocates the water. Palestinians today make up about 7 million of the population. Israelis are around 6 million. So there's almost about a million or so uh, people, you know, more Palestinians. Palestinians are allocated out of the entire water supply of the country. Palestinians are allocated 3% of the water. Three. Palestinians are allocated 3% of the water. So, it is so efficient, it is so efficient that if you've been to Palestine, you know you have a Palestinian village across the street sometimes from an Israeli settlement. You have an Israeli a neighborhood across the street from an Israeli uh, neighborhood, an Israeli settlement, a Palestinian across the street. On the Israeli side, which is how I grew up, you have you know, lawns and you go to the pool and you cook and you take a shower and you never think about water as a problem. The Palestinians across the street may or may not get something like 10, 12, 15 hours of running water per week. And they don't know when they're gonna come, they don't know how long they're gonna last. There's water insecurity, even when it's across the street. And this doesn't matter where the Palestinians live throughout the entire country, this is the case. Of course, it's more severe in the Gaza Strip. So when we talk about the apartheid, it's a very sophisticated kind of apartheid because Israel designated different parts of the population, different bureaucracies to deal with them, including sometimes different forms of, of law enforcement. Yes, yeah, so let, let's let's continue with with water rights then, um, because it not it's like you know while it is a, a, a desert. Um, uh, it, it could rain sometimes. Why? Uh, 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 what, what are the rights around collecting 
uh, rainwater, for example, or like what what are the different ways that water is 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 managed? Uh, as you were saying, you wanted to get into more. What uh, uh, well, what does that look like? Well, no, I mean, I mean, the, everything that everything that has to wa be to do with water is controlled by Mikorot, is controlled by Israel. Palestinians have no rights. Now the desert is only the southern part. Now, the rest, the rest of Palestine, the rest of oops, the rest of Palestine is not a desert. I mean, it's a very diverse, uh, uh, very diverse um, country. Um, so it's not all desert, certainly. But, uh, but you know, Palestinians are not permitted to dig a well. I mean, it's it's very very specific to what Palestinians are not allowed to do. The prohibitions and the laws that deny them the right to do things are unbelievable. Um, there was a piece by uh, Israeli human rights lawyer, Michal Sfard, who wrote, he wrote this about something else, he wrote this about something else, but he talks about mountains of regulations and, and, and oceans of laws that, you know, interfere and, and restrict the lives of, of Palestinians in general. So, so when we talk about the rules and regulations that are going to, you know, manage people's lives, uh, I, I tend to think about liberals. <laughs> Right, and, uh, and uh, so I want to. This is that, that's my my way of maybe trying to get us to start talking about um, uh, the the role of liberal Zionism and what appears to me at least to be uh, uh, an inflection point here, where it seems uh, my read of the situation is that it's 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 increasingly difficult to manage a liberal Zionism. Uh, both in the United States and domestically in Israel, that you know we just saw um, lots of uh, protests around uh, Bibi Netanyahu's attempt to re redo the Constitution, to uh, reduce the the court's ability to to rein him in. We saw a lot of protests around that. Now those protests didn't seem to extend to any sort of solidarity with Palestinian people, right? And, 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 right. and so like, the, the, the question really is like, you know, um, uh, and, and, you know the, the, the conservative um, uh, push is very straightforward. Uh, the, the logic seems very um, direct. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, the liberal perspective, one, seems to be uh, uh, dying uh, um, kind of at the ballot box. They don't seem to be uh, uh, doing well in the Knesset, but then also uh, it, it doesn't seem uh, to be able to, to, to say directly, like, well, you know, yes, I believe in human rights and, and people should be uh, uh, kept safe, but also Israel has the right to exist. These two things in the, in the face of, what are we at now, 15,000 people dead, doesn't seem to comport with one another. So what, what is your read on the, uh, the possibility that uh, a more a liberal left center Zionism, how long can that last uh, before people can just like don't, like, don't, don't even give it conscience like, you know, like at a pot? Yeah. Well, uh, just about, you said 15,000 dead. It's over. The official number from the, the, the Palestinian Health Ministry, which is downballing the number for now, is over 20,000. The expectation is that once the real numbers come in, and all the thousands of missing babies who have been crushed and burned by the Israeli warplanes are revealed, the number is going to exceed 50,000 deaths, civilian deaths. And so, um, just to you know, clarify where we stand here. Yeah, the, 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 the notion, the notion of, of, of liberal Zionism is that somehow, is this, is this working? Yeah, I'll just, yeah, yeah. I'll just, the notion, is this all right? Okay, there we go. Oh, yeah. right. We are, okay, and I have a, now a, a wired one, so we're good. Okay. The notion of liberal Zionism is an absurd notion that you could have a racist, violent, apartheid state that is somehow also wonderful and liberal and peace-loving and believes in human rights. It's an oxymoron, and it's an absolute impossibility. But what they've done is they said, no, 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 no. Among us, among the Israelis, we want to have our own little pretense uh, difference between the liberals and non-liberals, you know? And I'll give you an example of how absurd this notion of, of, of liberal Zionism is, okay? During the protests against Netanyahu and against the so-called judicial reform, which is much more than a judicial reform, but... Um, this was, this, these were protests by 
you know, the very top echelon of Israeli society. The privileged among the privileged. <coughs> now mind you, it's interesting that when other parts of Israeli society were protesting, in the 70s and 80s, the descendants of uh, Arab Jews were protesting, uh, about a decade ago or so, or a little bit less, the Ethiopian Jews were protesting. Nobody really cared. Now the privileged ones are protesting. Suddenly Joe Biden takes an interest. Okay? Now, among the privileged of the privileged, the cream of the crop, are the Israeli Air Force pilots. These mass murder war criminals who have no problem dropping tons of bombs on children in Gaza and Lebanon and other places. But they are considered, but they are considered, should somebody uh, be Do we have security here? You have to take it outside now. You better be Nobody said nothing. That's enough. Yeah, there are tons of people waiting outside. If you don't want to listen, you can go. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. There's a lot of people up here. Yeah, yep, yeah. so... Bye. All right. Okay, does anyone else need to leave? Don't forget your jacket, sir. <laughs> it is my jacket. Okay. And he's supposed to stop when it gets me here. Okay, we got, we got a seat up here, and we have some back there. It's not hate speech. Okay. I even know what I'm responding. Yeah. Sit down. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. All right. Okay. I appreciate everyone. Quiet, right? Keep it quiet. Okay, yes. Yeah, good. Quiet. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, okay. We would, I would like it to be quiet now. Yeah, all right. Okay. So we were talking. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, uh, during those uh, anti Netanyahu protests, the Israeli Air Force pilot reservists announced that they would not show up for reservist duty. Now they have to reserve, they have to show up for duty, you know, all the time. They need to keep their, you know, flight hours. Um, and they announced, there's a whole bunch of them that announced they will not show up to duty because they're going to the protests. They were so, their belief in democracy and, and the rule of law was so strong that they said it's even more important than our ability to, uh, you know, maintain our, 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 our military training. During this time, there was, there, was, there, were, there was an assault on Gaza. Immediately, they stopped caring about democracy, human rights, and they went in, did their training, and went to bomb Gaza. Now, as we're seeing the savagery, this, this massive, uncalled for, unjustified brutality against civilians in Gaza, we don't see these Air Force pilots protesting at all. We don't see them protesting. They're, they're, they're quite happy to keep bombing as they do. So that's the hypocrisy. That's the lie of, 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 liberal democracy, of the liberal Zionism. Zionism, I'll say this again, belongs in the same column as anti-Semitism, as white supremacy, and all other forms of racism. Violent racism for which there should be no tolerance. Liberal, not liberal, this color, that color, this shade, that shade. There are no shades in racism. You know, I have a great Jewish friend in San Diego. He goes, I reject, uh, I reject racism. What's your position? <laughs> it's very simple. And when you ask that to Zionists, they say, yes, but. There's always a but. On racism, there's no but. You reject it, or you're, or you're, or you're a part of it, you're accepted. 
And Zionism is no different than all other forms. So liberal Zionism, again, it's, it's, it's nonsense, it's a myth. So then, there's a, something interesting, both uh, mostly in, in American politics. Of now, let's let's talk about the conservatives, particularly evangelical Christians. They seem to really appreciate Israel, <laughs> right? Um, what is evangelical Christians' role in uh, America's support? of Israel. Why, why are evangelical Christians who, I should rem remind everyone, prior to Reagan basically did not vote. They were not a voting bloc of, of really any sort. They didn't see it as a you know, terrestrial concern worth their time. Uh, but ever since Reagan, it seems like e evangelicals have become a very, very uh, secure voting bloc um, for, for the right. Uh, and and have almost uh, 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 across the board supported Israel. Why why is that? Well, Zionism was a Christian evangelical uh, invention. The the you, I'm sure you've heard the line uh, a people without a country for a country without a people. This was invented by Christian Zionists before the Zionists took it on. Before there was Jew, there were Jews who who who, uh, who created the Zionist movement. Many of the Zionist ideas that we know today, like that particular lie among others, um, were adopted by the Jewish Zionists from, uh, from Christian Zionists, from Christian evangelicals, you know. So they, they, this has been part of their agenda for a very long time. And the fact that these, uh, these um, secular Jews who decided to adopt Zionism and develop it, took it on so, so you know, with such uh, vigor, yeah, you know, this is, this is great for, for, for evangelical Christians because they have this whole belief that the Jewish people, that the Jews today are the descendants of an ancient tribe that used to live in Palestine some 3,000 years ago called the Hebrews. That's part of this story, that's part of the myth. And that these Jews today all have to return to that part of Palestine, which they call the land of Israel, in order for the second Messiah and the coming and all kinds of, you know, that sort of nonsense. And, so, and just, uh, you know, two Jews talking right here. What, what's their plan for us when that happens? I don't think it's anything good. <laughs> no, no, it's not good, right? Okay, all right. Okay. Although, 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 okay, if you want to, if you want to, I had a good friend who, who became an, uh, uh, kind of a born again, and she said to me, uh, that's not true. As long as you, as long as you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, you will be fine. <laughs> so it's not quite that way. But yeah, of course, it has nothing to do with. with uh, it's a deeply, deeply, of course, um, not to say crazy, but anti certainly anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, anti-Semitic view. God, God hates them for this one weird trick that gets you on <laughs> being. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's um, I, I, let's keep with the. Um, uh, with the religion for a, a, a moment, and I, I got I'm looking through some of the questions that uh, some people uh, already gave me, and there's one um, in particular that you know, that, so, for an atheist, right? Uh, what, 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 where would uh, someone who, who identifies strongly as an atheist, where would their um, politics go here, and how much should they ascribe to religion specifically as an institution as part of, of this uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Palestinian-Israel conflict? That's a really good question. You know, the, the, what makes the Palestinian issue unique, in my opinion, is that it's not about religion and it's not about politics. It has nothing to do with religion, it has nothing to do with politics. It's a question of values. I had this conversation once uh, with some Zionists who came to a lecture that I gave, one of the very few times that they showed up, and they were angry because this was again during a time of of Israeli, you know, Israeli uh, air, uh, you know, air force planes massacring thousands of civilian, innocent civilians, and um, and I spoke the way I did, and they said, "How dare you speak, you know, speak like this?" and so on. I said, "Look, it's a question of values," and I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. We know that Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza, you know, there's a lot of discussion about Al-Shifa Hospital as Israel, as, as it was being bombed and so forth. And the claim that the Zionists made and Israel made is that somehow under the hospital there were fighters or there was weapons or something. 
and therefore it was okay to do what they did. We found that, right? So, here's where the values come in. Let's say that the devil himself lived under the hospital. The devil himself lived under the hospital. Does that justify harming a single hair of the head of a child, yes or no? no. End of story. That's the only question that matters. Because if you say yes, the conversation's over. If anybody thinks, if anybody thinks that that scenario justifies, never mind killing, never mind burning, never mind destroying, destroying, harming a single hair on the head of a child. If anybody who feels that that is justified, goodbye, the conversation is over. There's nothing we can say to each other anymore. It's a question of values. And on the larger issue, the question is this. You either support racism, apartheid, and violence, and supremacy, and then go ahead and support Israel, but own it. Own it. Go ahead and support Israel, because that's what it is, and own it. Some people think it's fine to murder, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of people in Gaza. Some people think it's fine to maintain the apartheid regime. Fine, own it, though. Because the other side, the other side talks about justice, talks about freedom, talks about equal rights, and talks about the possibility, really the only possibility, of peace between Israelis and Palestinians. So these are the two choices. Take out Israeli, take out Palestinian. One is a vote for racism and violence, which will never, of course, cannot possibly lead to peace, right? I mean, racism and violence is the opposite of peace. The other, calls for justice, calls for liberation, calls for freedom, calls for equality, which will inevitably lead to peace between the two nations. So, do you believe in peace, or do you believe in racism? And then own it. It's a question of values. Own it, because the support for the one side, we know, can never, ever, under any circumstance, lead to peace. The other peace is inevitable. So it's a question of values. And then you own it. Find what your inner self, find out what your values are, and then own it. And that's why, and I'm sure it's a question that's coming up, someone like me, who was raised in a deeply Zionist uh, family, my grandfather's signature sits on the Israeli Declaration of Independence, I had a great uncle who was the president of the state of Israel, and my father was a general. And not just a general, but a general of that generation of generals that everybody thinks were gods. And here I am telling you, well, what I've already said, I won't repeat it. But the point is, it's about finding your values. Once you find out, once you find out about the injustice, do you continue to support it? Or do you reject it, regardless of your background, regardless of your religion, regardless of your education, regardless of your family? And that's why I'm here today saying the things that I say. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring this around to, uh, towards the end of our conversation so we can start to get to audience questions. I'm going to combine a couple here and say that, you know, since. Um, as far as we we found so far, the devil does not live under the Al Shifa Hospital, and uh, and and not 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 too many people live under there either. It seems uh, haven't haven't found a lot under there, um, but. It, it, but it seems strange then that you know the United States would still then say um, you know to make a, a, a local connection here, um, build bunker buster bombs in Water Valley and send them to uh, to Israel, right? Um, what I'm just going to distill uh, several of these into one very simple question: What does the United States get out of all this? Why why are we in this special relationship? I know it's a small question, but like what what uh, um, like, like what what is it that the United States just can't get enough of this one particular kind of of uh, of uh, violence? And like we, we like we're not trying to 
get rid of the, you know, the, the, you know, the genocide of Myanmar. We didn't, we, you know, we weren't too excited about that one. Uh, but for some reason, this one um, seems uh, really important to at the core of American interests. Why is that? And also, the apart the amnesty report about Myanmar was accepted. The one about Palestine was not, which yeah. is also an interesting dif uh, difference. You know, many, many decades ago, some of us are old enough to either remember or remember to have learned about it. There was an American president who warned America from this thing called the um, uh, industrial military complex. Yes. Military. Industrial complex, sorry, military industrial complex, thank you. See, I, I wasn't there yet. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. What he envisioned is a fraction of what exists today. A fraction, I don't think he could have possibly imagined the monstrosity that exists today in terms of in terms of in terms of, of, of this this enormous you know industry. Now we all know that about half of the aid that go of the four billion or so dollars in aid that go to Israel come back here in arms sales. And so it's kind of a laundering of money. So that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. The other part is what I said earlier there's nobody presenting the other case. So American politicians, if they wanted, let's assume for a moment at least some of them would want to make an informed decision on this issue. They do not have the tools to do so because they have never been presented in a, in a, in a comprehensive, well-organized manner, consistent manner, the other story. All they hear is this one compelling story. So it's very easy to be one-sided. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a very uh, um, apt answer, and it lets me slide right into the <laughs> the, the last question that um, that I have. That uh, again compares a couple of uh, combines a couple of these here. You know, like uh, the ability to, to to speak out and organize on this. The. Uh, um, the, the uh, you know every, I think everyone here might or not everyone here but I think a lot of people would want like a, a magic word or or a, or a, an argument that suddenly gets everyone to realize what's going on right and I, I this one's been sitting at the top for me for for a while is that uh, what's gonna work to make people realize the depths of oppression of Palestinians. Uh, both Muslims and, and, and Christians, which you know, and uh, um, and, and, and I, I, this also says here Ethiopian Jews, and and so what, uh, let, let's talk about what that opposite um, message would be, uh, because it's a it, it, you're going up against like a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of arguments made over decades, right? Uh, and a lot of assumptions and, and, and people's uh, facts are are colored by and, and shaped by the you know um, uh, again these decades of effort to to make Israel seem like what it is in the United States. So so what how, how do you start uh, uh, you know what, what's what's the opposite? Edu education. The only way to do it is through a comprehensive look. Like I said earlier, the Zionists very early on invested very heavily so that they would have a hand, they would have influence in education, in culture, in philanthropy, in local politics, in national politics. You know, there are, there are Zionist uh, nonprofits that that's what they do in every state. They check the uh, social studies textbooks. They check and they approve or disapprove and they have discussions on this issue. Social studies textbooks to make sure that this issue is taught in a way that is favorable to their perspective. You know, that's, that's that, you know, talk about micromanaging. I mean, they are all the way down to the very nitty gritty of how education is done. So education is a key and what is missing, lacking, and I and a few friends in Washington, D.C. are trying to remedy that through an initiative that we're working on, um, I, needs to be remedied in a systemic way so that decision makers, the press, the diplomatic corps, um, and the public are presented with, I don't want to say a handbook, but at least something like a handbook where they can, they can ha have the answers to these questions. You know, every campus, as a Hillel house, which is basically a Zionist, uh, you know, holding uh, place. 
It's a, you know, it's a Zionist institu institution. On top of that, they have whatever the mascot is, the blah, blah for Israel on every campus. You know, they've got a handbook. They know how to answer, they know how to attack, they know what to say. On the Palestinian side, it's just a bunch of kids who are trying to make this work and stand up for what's right. So until that is remedied on a large scale, in a well-planned scale, just like theirs is, it's not gonna change. It's all about education. It's all about educating and presenting this in a way that is, that is you know, I don't think it's a problem to make it compelling because this, the, 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 the Palestinian story is based on truth. And we, we can give, you know, one, one example if you, if, you, uh, if you want. Please. The claim that I said earlier that they made the desert bloom, that they came to a country without a people. Um, there are two, two uh, uh, books that I strongly recommend. One of them was written, co-authored co by Francesca Albanese, Dr. Francesca Albanese, who is now the UN Rapporteur for the Occupied Territories. And it came out a couple, it was reprinted a couple of years ago, and it's called uh, Palestinian Refugees in International Law. It's a very scholarly work. And in this, they describe, among many things, not only how strong the case is for Palestinian refugees. In fact, it gets stronger by, with time, not weaker by time. Their case for reparations, their case for return, but also what was stolen. You know, the impression that people, when usually people talk about 1948 about land, homes that were stolen, land that was stolen, but there was also entire cities were taken. I mean, there were entire, in Palestine, there were entire cities. Haifa, Akka, Tabaria, Yafa, Lid, Jerusalem, Berisabe, still, I mean, you could go on and on and on. Just, just, these are just the cities. Major cities that were stolen, taken. Public, public property that was taken. People had money in the bank. The bank, the money was stolen. Produce from the fields. Jaffa oranges is an example. You know, Palestine was exporting citrus. Palestine was exporting olive oils. Palestine was exporting cotton. Palestine was exporting barley, and on and on and on. All that was stolen. So there's much more than that. In other words, the Zionists didn't take a barren country and made it bloom. They stole a country that was in full bloom and made it their own and pretended that it's theirs. And then they perpetuated this ridiculous myth that somehow they made the desert bloom. In the Nakab, in the Nakab, in the Nakab, if you look at, and I've seen these, if you look at aerial photos taken by the British when the British took Palestine, you see tracts of cultivated land. These are the Palestinian Bedouin who are cultivating the land. They didn't make anything bloom. They stole stuff that was in full bloom. So, something happened. On the 15th of May, 1948, the world was hit by amnesia because the world was doing commerce and business with Palestine. Maps, you know, said Palestine. Even the, this, this horrific plan called the Partition Plan by the United Nations was called the Partition of Palestine. Suddenly everybody forgot. There was no Palestine, it's all Israel. They brought out this name and let the uh, apartheid regime use it as their name, imposed it on Palestine, and that's it, the world forgot. From that moment on, there was no Palestine, it's all Israel. Even today, people say, Palestine, Israel, Israel, Palestine. What do you mean Palestine, Israel, Israel, Palestine? It's Palestine. The fact that this group of, of, of settlers and colonizers took a country and, and gave it a different name doesn't change the fact that it's Palestine. But this is one of those things that unless you are really well read, really well informed, and willing and able to put all the time in, you're not gonna know. So unless it's presented to you in a way that's, you know, as part of your education, it's not gonna happen. And that's, that's exactly the problem. Uh, they, they also, if I remember correctly, call themselves colonists until that was a word you weren't supposed to use. They use it today yeah, in Hebrew. Yeah, 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 okay. In Hebrew, yeah. the word mitachel is a very proud word. Kovesh, mitnachel, conquer, uh, uh, a settler, it's everywhere. I can't, I can't forget, I, I'll never forget this. I was meeting with a Palestinian friend in Yaffa, and he said to me, let's meet by the, um, uh, the, the, the occupiers, the, uh, the occupiers um, parking lot. I said, the who? 
the Occupier's parking lot. It's sitting on a street called the Occupier Street. You know, Hebrew people don't even think about this. You know, I have, I have friends who live on Settler, Settler Road. They don't think anything of it. Settler was a good thing. They came to settle the land. Of course, they were pioneers. You know, they're great people. They don't think about it. In English, they have a problem. Don't you dare say settler. Don't you dare say occupier. Don't you dare say colonizer. But in Hebrew, they have no problem. Okay, well, those were my questions. Thank you so much for answering them. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to turn to, to audience questions now. If you gave me your question and you don't feel like I did it justice, I will give it back to you and you can uh, ask it yourself. But what, So the way this is going to work, I'm actually going to give you this one. I'm going to do my best Jerry Springer impression uh, by uh, 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 going around, and I'm going to, um, just like he did, also a good Jew, um, uh, uh, give you, um, uh, hand you the microphone, but I am going to hold on to it. All right? You'll ask your question, uh, uh, we will answer it, and then, and then we'll, we'll move on. I'm sure there are pl plenty of people that want to ask questions, and again, the library closes at 9. We're giving, us, uh, giving everyone ample time to do this, all right, and then, um, and I will, I will ask uh, two things of you. One, make it a question, right? Okay, it's a question. This is question Q and A, right? So have your cues, not your comments, your cues, questions. Second thing is that you have to be respectful of our guest. If you are not respectful of our guest, I'm just taking the microphone away and we're done. All right. So, I, challenging questions? You can take a challenging question, right? Yeah, you can, you can take a couple of challenging questions. You, know, like you, you don't need to use kid gloves on him, but it does have to be, it does have to be respectful. Uh, I, that's, that's just something that I personally, as an educator, uh, I have to do, and all of my TikTok adult students are capable of it, so you, you can too. Okay? All right, so uh, let me see those hands. All right. That's what I thought. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make the rounds. All right, so uh, I, I'm gonna pick a hand. You can put your hand down, rest it, and then we'll we'll, we'll go again. All right, this will this will happen. All right, first one. My question is: We're talking about the Palestinian state or country. Until 1967, the Six Days War, you didn't have to ask for a Palestinian state or the identification or something from nobody because all this area was under the rule of the Jordanians. Why before 67, nobody came to the Jordanian and said, hey guys, we want our own state. Suddenly, it became a huge problem after 67. Why don't we take a couple more, okay. and I'll, I'll just uh, okay. write it in the paper. Uh, you got the, all right, uh, another question, okay. Let's take maybe three at a time. Okay. What about Hamas? What about Hamas? All right, and, uh, can, you can you please tell us what happened in 2005 in Gaza, and how many Jewish people live today in Gaza, and how many Gaza people can go and work in Israel? Can you explain it? And I just want to have one comment. I'm Israeli, I'm Jewish, I have no problem with Muslim. And I think that what he's doing is trying to put us apart, for real. Many of the facts okay. are not right. The United okay. Nations right. vote for a Jewish country, yep. side by side with the Palestinian. Thank you. you should go back that, that, that's three. That's, uh, that's three. All right, that's three. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's let me go speak to this. Thank you, thank you all three. Uh, I, I, the first question, I, I don't accept the premise of the question that before 1967 there was no issue of Palestinian uh, liberation. It's not true. The Palestinians, the Palestinian issue and, and the issue of Palestinian, <coughs> excuse me, can I have some water? Okay. The issue of, of, of Palestinians um, wanting their liberation, wanting their freedom, and wanting their country back began as soon as, 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 the, as Palestine was taken by the Zionists in 1948. 1967 was just, thank you. Nineteen sixty seven was just the second step in the Zionist taking of Palestine, kind of the, what they call the, the finishing the job. And then a Zionist idea came up, which is a Zionist idea, of the two state solution as we know it today, 
where uh, a Palestinian state might be limited to just these two little areas called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And I'll tell you a little story about that. I'll expand on it a little bit. So my father was one of the generals who planned and then executed the 1967 assault by Israel against his Arab neighbors. I think calling it a war is, 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 creates a misunderstanding. And there was a, it was a brutal assault by Israel against its neighbors for the sake of taking land. And, um, and, and the generals themselves said this. My father and others said it after the war. And um, the war actually only lasted five days, by the way. You know why they call it six days, the six day war, because in the Jewish prayer book, the term six days shows up a lot. In, and in reference to the miracle of creation, that the world was created in six days. So to create this impression, this connection between this the miracle of creation and the miracle of the 1967 war. <laughs> and I have on my podcast a conversation with, um, with Phil Weiss from Wanda Weiss. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the fact that very educated, secular Jews in America, and others, not only Jews, refer to that as a miracle. They don't believe in miracles or, or, or religion at all, but that to them was a miracle. So there was no miracle. But on the fifth day of the war, the Israeli military high command met and at that meeting, my father stood up and said, we now have a, an opportunity to solve the Palestinian question in our, in our, to our advantage. We will offer the Palestinians a small state on a small fraction of historic Palestine, two regions within Palestine that Israel created, that Israel drew, which are called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, because historically there's no such thing as a Gaza Strip or a West Bank drawn the way it is. Israel determined that as their boundaries at, you know, after the 48, after it was established. He stood up and he said this, and the other generals, his comrades, Tzachak Rabin and others, looked at him and said, what are you talking about? We just finished the job of taking our land back, and you want us to give it back to someone? And he said, what we should do now is we should give the Sinai back to the Egyptians, the Golan Heights back to the Syrians, allow the Palestinians a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, with East Jerusalem as their capital, we will have peace agreements with all these countries and we can move on. It only lasted five days, by the way. Do you know why they call it six days? The six day war, because in the Jewish prayer book, the term six days shows up a lot in, and in reference to the miracle of creation, that the world was created in six days. So to create this impression, this connection between this, the miracle of creation and the miracle of the 1967 war, and I have on my podcast a conversation with, um, with Phil Weiss from Wanda Weiss. And he talks about the fact that very educated, secular Jews in America, and others, not only Jews, refer to that as a miracle. They don't believe in miracles or, or, or religion at all, but that to them was a miracle. So there was no miracle. But on the fifth day of the war, the Israeli military high command met. And at that meeting, my father stood up and said, we now have a, an opportunity to solve the Palestinian question in our, in our, to our advantage. We will offer the Palestinians a small state on a small fraction of historic Palestine, two regions within Palestine that Israel created, that Israel drew, which are called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, because historically there's no such thing as a Gaza Strip or a West Bank drawn the way it is. Israel determined the, as their boundaries at, you know, after the 48, after it was established. He stood up and he said this, and the other generals, his comrades, Tzachak Rabin and others, looked at him and said, what are you talking about? We just finished the job of taking our land back, and you want us to give it back to someone? And he said, what we should do now is we should give the Sinai back to the Egyptians, the Golan Heights back to the Syrians, allow the Palestinians a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip with East Jerusalem as their capital. We will have peace agreements with all these countries, and we can move on. And he pursued this, you know, he remained in the military for another year before he retired, and his comrades said, look, we don't, nobody wants to talk about this nonsense right now. And as, as he was saying these words, as he was saying these words, the, the smoke was still, you know, coming out of the war, of this, of this assault. Israeli bulldozers were destroying Palestinian towns, Palestinian neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, throughout the West Bank, and building massively for Jews only in those areas, immediately. Immediately, areas within East Jerusalem, within the Old City, were bulldozed. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians expelled. 
as he was still saying these words. Israel didn't have to think, didn't take a minute even, before they began the destruction, because this was going to be a part of the state of Israel. So, the conversation about two states was later on adopted by Palestinians as, as kind of a gesture. Fine, we will give up the struggle to free all of Palestine. We will give up on the idea, which is a Palestinian idea, of a democratic state with equal rights in historic Palestine for this idea of a two-state solution. And again, Israel continued to build and build and build and make it absolutely clear that this will never happen. Every single government throughout, from that moment on made it sure, made everything they can, did everything they can to make sure that there would never be any Palestinian state. And then Israelis say, see, we want a Palestinian state and they won't want it. Who created a single state from the river to the sea? Not the Palestinians, Israel did. Israel created a single state for Jews only with privilege and rights for Jews only from the river to the sea. And when Palestinians say, no, 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 but how about equality from the river to the sea? How about a democratic state with equal rights? They say, see, that's anti-Semitic. How dare they say equality? We want privilege, we want supremacy. That's our idea. So this notion that somehow before 1967 nobody talked about Palestinian rights is an outright lie. So it's either a lie or it comes out of ignorance. I'm not sure what the particular case here right, is. I'm but it's either a lie or it's ignorance because it's absolutely false. It's absolutely, it's it's, it's, it's absolutely it's based lie. on false. You're calling me ignorant, now, but I'm not. You're telling the people completely lies. You cannot call me ignorant. Do you want to stop it more? Okay, the other question, the second question was Hamas. I'm thinking, what is the, what was the chance of somebody asking about Hamas? <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. I'll, 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 answer the, I'll answer the question on a larger context. We hear a lot in the news, the war between Israel and Hamas, or the war between Israel and Gaza, or this war that started by Hamas, or the war that started by Gaza. Hamas is part of the Palestinian resistance. It's a resistance organization. It was established during the for just as the first intifada in the late 80s as part of the Palestinian resistance movement. <laughs> resistance organizations don't start wars. Resistance organizations <coughs> resist. They resist oppression. They respond to oppression. They respond to violence. And the war is not between Israel and this faction or that faction, and certainly not between Israel and the Gaza Strip, although the state of Israel declared war on the Palestinian people in 1948. It was before the, it was the state of Israel, it was the Zionist movement. They declared war on the Palestinian people, and it's been going on for 75 years. When Palestine, and, and now Israel has a massive army. Palestinians have never had an army. Palestinians don't have, a, never have had a tank. They've never had a war plane. Ever. And so, do you want these people to maybe be quiet or leave or figure out what they're going to do? Yeah. All right, we're, uh, are we good? All right. Thank you. And so, some of the, the, this idea that it's a war anyway, it's not a war because a war is something that happens between two armies, between two military forces. Here we have an army versus civilians and small guerrilla groups who try to, you know, defend their people. Um, but that's all I have to say about Hamas. Hamas is a, is a resistance organization that is doing what resistance organizations do. Um, another question was about the Gaza disengagement of 2005. So in 2005, the Israeli government decided to take out the settlers uh, from the Gaza Strip, some 7,000, I believe, or 6,000 settlers from the Gaza Strip, and close down the Gaza Strip so that when Israel decides to bomb, and when Israel decides to impose a siege, then they won't have these settlers in the way, because it costs a lot of money to protect these settlers, to use the army to protect the settlers. Now, the Gaza Strip has been a prison, you know, going back till when the Gaza Strip was established in the early 50s, late 49, 52, you know, in that period, as a place in which to push hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees from southern Palestine. 
And ever since then, it's been a disaster area. So this region, the Gaza City and other cities along the region, which were known for uh, you know, citrus fruits, for fishing, for beauty, you know, the city of Gaza has a rich history, culture, uh, monastic, uh, uh, rich monastic history, and on and on and on, suddenly became a prison. Suddenly became this massive refugee camp. And of course, today, it's, it's, it's even worse. So the disengagement was just a tactical move by the Israeli government so that they can, they can focus on the Palestinians only and not worry about, uh, about Israeli settlers getting in the way. Okay, oh, we're gonna take another three. All right, we're gonna go first here. Hi, Imam Rafiq Umar Muslim from Bethlehem. Um, question is, I'm a person of resolution, right? And so I always look for solutions. If you were to write down a list of demands, and these were the Israeli des demands, what would you say those demands are that the Palestinians, if they agreed to or accepted, that would end conflict? And I think you kind of already answered this, but do you think a two-state solution is a possibility? Thank you. All right, uh, second one. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, Miko, in, in your book, uh, you, you mentioned that there was this hope of peace at the time of, uh, of Rabin before his assassination, and at the same time, he also had the break your bones policy, and you mentioned that throughout history, it's always been uh, one government after another that's been oppressing the Palestinian one, you know, um, generation after generation. Do you think there actually was a concerted effort on the side of uh, the Israeli government to actually extend peace to the Palestinians, or was it thinly veiled and it gave the image that they wanted it, but they actually never did? All right, and one more. I'm going to take over here. Hey, it's okay. Everybody's person is asking questions. <laughs> Hi. So, um, if you could help the audience understand, there is a famous quote by Ababan saying, the Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And so they're blamed for not being the partners in peace and walking away from that beautiful golden opportunity to have their own state. Could you help these audience understand what that uh, ridiculous, ridiculous uh, proposal that was, they were trying to shove down their throat as a two-state solution? Okay, uh, good questions. Uh, Israel does not want to end the conflict. Israel made it clear very, that peace is not a strategic objective. And they made it clear very early on when the state of Israel was established. Their objective is to be the toughest, meanest, craziest bully in the neighborhood so that nobody messes with them. That's it. And throughout the decades since Israel was established, whenever there was any, any politician who pushed for a more peaceful policy, they were pushed out. Moshe Sharet being the most famous of them all. He was the, Israel's second prime minister for about five minutes. And he was Israel's foreign minister and he was a well-known diplomat. He's like the Israeli John Adams, the prime minister that nobody remembers ever existed. And he was pushed out because he opposed the, uh, Israel's uh, assault against Egypt in 1956. And other assaults as well. So anyway, so this, this, it was very, made very, very clear. And the, and the ideology be behind this was articulated uh, in a eulogy that was made of a famous by Moshe Dayan, who was the general of the uh, eye patch, yes. that he made in 1956, where he said, these Palestinian refugees are looking at land, we're cultivating their land, we're living in their homes, we're living in their cities, and they want to kill us for that. They're looking at us, they're hungry, they're homeless, therefore we must always, always keep, make sure that we have our fist, that we hold the weapons, the strongest weapons. And so these were early signs of that, and then we see a 75-year history of a country that clearly not missed an opportunity, but erased any opportunity to end this, to resolve the conflict. As long as Palestinians are dying at a higher rate, and they have no military force anyway, they can't defend themselves, the other Arab countries are out of the equation, there's no reason to end the conflict. Israel doesn't have a reason to end the conflict. And so it's not, it's not, not a strategic objective. There's no reason for it to do so. 
And so there's no list of demands because they, that's not something they, they want anyway, you know. And we've seen this, like I said, over the years, that every opportunity that it seemed like maybe there's a chance here, maybe something is going to happen, it was made very, very clear, you know. Um, even the peace agreement with Egypt was done with pain, great pain, great, great pain. But it was done. But that's it. And there was a larger strategic reason to get Egypt out of the cycle, so to, to kind of disarm Egypt so it's no longer something that uh, Israel has to worry about. Okay, the two-state solution uh, was never a possibility. It was a myth from the very beginning. Like I explained earlier, Israel, did ever, Israel did, made sure that there would never be a Palestinian state on any part of historic Palestine. And they did it by creating, like I said, a single state, albeit an apartheid state, from the river to the sea. So it's never been a possibility. It's always been a myth, and it's certainly not a possibility. Uh, today, and I don't even know what the virtue of a two-state okay. solution uh, uh, is. Mika, we, we've been asked to uh, not say river to the sea. Why not? Why not? The river Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. That's the geographical description of the country. It's a joke. It's a geographical description of the country. I'm sorry? I'm trying to allow this program to happen. No, I understand, but I'm saying it's, it's like a, a the, description, the geographical description of the country is between and you can call it Israel. I mean, you can say it's Israel, but it's from the River Jordan. Pull up a map. The River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. Can we just stay? Can we just try to stay? Okay, I'll say it differently. I'll say it differently. I'm trying to allow the program to happen. Thank you, Jen. It's very interesting that people who are standing there unashamedly supporting violence and murder are trying to impose their rules on the majority of people here by stating what they like and can't It's absolutely ludicrous. The people who support, who support this horrific violence against innocent civilians dare to make uh, conditions to allow the majority of the people to have a conversation. And there's somebody over there standing with a, t with, a, with a shirt, with a symbol of one of the worst, most violent terrorist organizations. Are you calling me up? Uh, the, uh, an organization that is probably the most, the most violent, although the, most, the, most, the best trained and the best armed terrorist organization in the world. And she's wearing their t-shirt. She's wearing a t-shirt of a terrorist organization. I'm just pointing it out. She's wearing a shirt that is offensive. Yes, she's wearing an offensive. If I wore a swastika, I wouldn't call it out. If I wore a swastika, I wouldn't call it out. If I wore a swastika, I wouldn't call it out. That is offensive. That is offensive. There are Palestinians here, there are Muslims here, and that is offensive. It's like somebody standing here with a Confederate flag. It is unacceptable. Exactly. And there are Jewish people here, many Jewish people here, who find it offensive. There's a coalition of people here who find it offensive. I'm an Israeli. I am entitled and allowed to No, you're not. Yes, I am. Of course, entitled. Israelis are always entitled. I'm going to take a moderate prerogative here and ask, what, uh, uh, get us on track with one simple question. Let, let's, let's, say, let's, let's say we were all, we were in uh, the, the first Bethlehem. And we were all Israelis. What would happen to us if Mr. we were having this conversation? All right, if we were having this conversation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If we were having this conversation in Israel in the actual Bethlehem, right, the first one, uh, what would happen to all of us in Palestine? Yeah. 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 What would what would what would happen? We were Palestinians. Yeah, if we were Israelis, we were Israeli right now, citizens right, right now, now this, this, having this conversation right about now, the war. Right now, in the state of Israel, this conversation would not be allowed. It would not be allowed. People would either, it would either be canceled or we would have been arrested. It by the Israeli be authorities. Here. By the Israeli okay. Alright, let me, let me, let's go back to this, okay? Let's go back to this. Let's, let's go back to this. We're done. We're done. We're done. Oh my God. We are done.
You know what? Why can't you just ask them to leave? They don't even want to hear. They don't even want to hear. Everyone, 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 everyone. I know everyone's is, is really heightened. Let's all take a moment and relax. We, we got a speaker here. My name is Ian. I'm with the, the coalition to, to, to end the violence in Palestine. He is a personal friend of mine, all right? Miko has been a friend of mine for a long time. But I'm speaking as a Palestinian. Please, everyone, calm down. Let's end the event. Let's end the event on good trips. Let's get the event going. If people continue to shut this down, he's not going to not come back to Albany again. We'll get him here again because he's a friend of mine. We'll get him here again. Yeah, but I but let's finish the event. Yes. 20 minutes? Yeah. We'll get 20 minutes. Please respect our safety. You made a commitment last night. All right. Why are you literally rubbing for it? I'm sorry. Why? What is there to enjoy? Because we Everyone, my name is Caroline Brigatella. I'm a member of the board. This is Mark Kissinger. He is president of the board. You saw us last, many of you saw us last night. Yes. I would like to make something clear. There is no legal definition of hate speech. That being said, everyone has an opportunity to communicate if they think that has happened. When something that was said was said that is generally accepted as problematic. Jeff got up to the front of the room and he stopped it. I understand that other things are being said here tonight that people may have an issue with. What we ask you to do is we ask you to also exercise your First Amendment right and communicate that to the board, to the library staff, and to the board. There are mechanisms to do that. They are available, am I correct, Jeff, that they are available on our website? Mark and I are also here, and we are happy to give you that information. Once that information is communicated to us, the library staff and the board have the opportunity to consider it and consider what actions we may take either in our policies or who may make use of our policies. So I, I, I understand. Let her finish. Don't back down to the crowd. I, we are not going to back down to the crowd. I would like to ask everyone who think who has thoughts on what is being said here tonight to allow them to be said. It's too late. And excuse me. To allow them to be said and to, then to communicate your reasons and your belief why you think they are hate speech. I am not, we are not the arbiters of hate speech. Like I said, there is no legal definition of it. But we are a library board who can consider your thoughts and your opinions on that and how that fits into the community once that speech is spoken. You called a woman a terrorist. In the interest of free speech all around, as, as the gentleman said, Let's finish the program. You were let's, cutting it off. You're bowing to them. Let's, 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 let's let everyone use their First Amendment rights to the best of their ability this evening. Mark and I are going to go stand outside. If you have questions about how to communicate to us, you are welcome to do so. Jeff, as library director, will continue to stand in this room as a witness to what is being said, and if a specific phrase is repeated again, am I correct, Jeff, that you will take action against that? Thank you, everyone. We, there was wonderful dialogue in the library last night. It was peaceful. We would like to maintain that peace. Thank you. I'd like to once again reiterate uh, uh, the, the thanks to the uh, uh, Bethlehem Public Library for, uh, for being brave and putting this on. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're now going to take another three questions. Do you have one more? You're not done. Okay, yeah, keep going. But just okay. don't say Mississippi, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Okay. So, um, 
So let me, I'll, I'll finish the, I think it's fair enough to answer the questions that were asked. There were good questions. So regarding the Oslo time, um, the Oslo time was, was very interesting because many of us who are still naive and believe the liberal democracy, liberal Zionism, like myself, and many others, uh, thought that, you know, this was this was early 90s, you know, the Soviet Union fell, apartheid fell, Mandela became president, and there was a sense that Palestine is next. And I think this helped feed this notion that if Mandela was free, if the clerk could receive the Nobel Peace Prize, then yes, even a war criminal like a Tucker Bean can become a peacemaker. And I remember my father, who of course knew Rabin very well because they worked together for decades, um, but uh, said when Rabin shook hands with Arafat that Rabin crossed the Rubicon. In other words, he made this gesture that is irreversible, that makes a statement. This was end of 1993. My father died in March of 1995. The last article he wrote was titled uh, Requiem to Oslo. And then just before he died, there were several interviews with him in the major Israeli papers where he said, Rabin does not want peace, Israel does not want peace. And Rabin was getting the Nobel Peace Prize. And people said to him, what are you talking to you say this? He said, well, read the Accords. The Oslo Accords are not leading to peace. Look at what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. It is very clear that Israel has no interest in peace. And today, in hindsight, of course, it's 50-50, 2020, whatever it is, um, it's clear that the reality we live in today was the direct result of Oslo. Oslo was a, a spectacular success. The Oslo process led Israel to tougher control on the Palestinians, on their land, and on their, basically, life and the country itself. So again, when we look back and we see what happened over the decades, it's clear that the purpose of Oslo was to, do, to, to happen what we see now, which is Israel basically controlling all of Palestine. Palestinians have less and less rights. So there was never, ever an Israeli effort to make peace. There was no interest, like I said, by Israel to make peace. And I think the, the, the quote about the opportunity, of an opportunity is just one more racist, uh, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian uh, slogan that I, you know, I think we all know is not really worthy of, uh, of any attention. Okay. So we're ready for another three? I am. Yeah. Okay. Voice is still right. working. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is basically a question that I have written. I have no dog in this affair at all. I'm an atheist. But you pay taxes, and what, right? And what I say yeah. is that the, there is utterly no solution. You can see the passion of the crowd. If you continue to believe in something that has no basis in fact. The only solution for the Middle East is atheism and make it into a park and, and end, this, end this religion and class and ethnic divide that is now simple, sad murder. All right, uh, second. Yeah, enjoy. Okay, uh, so you meant, I was intrigued by the, um, uh, the the, the comment of the suggestion that you made about the education for the Palestinian right. So I was wondering, do, what do you think, or who do you think can spearhead this uh, ed proper education for Palestinian without being labeled as anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist? Uh, clearly, the previous efforts are not working well. And a third. All right, yeah, I'm go back here. I'm just curious to know your thoughts on what is going to happen over the next month, two months in Gaza. All right. All right. So the the gentleman, the gentleman with the no dog. Where do you go? If you pay taxes in this country, then you have a dog in the game. I'm sorry. Americans, Americans, unless they stand up clearly in opposition to Zionism and clearly support the Palestinian call for justice, freedom, and equality, are complicit in war crimes. I'm sorry. Because, and I know, I know this sounds, I know this sounds, I know this sounds, uh, you know, very harsh. But, but. 
This country is, claims to be a democracy. The people who vote to send the billions of dollars and the weapons to Israel are elected by us. The politicians that have no problem associating themselves with Zionism, which like I said is, uh, earlier, like anti-Semitism and white supremacy is a racist ideology, are voted by us. Why in the world would you vote for somebody who declares that they support racism? Why in the world would you vote for anybody who sends weapons to a country that we know now because Amnesty told us, but we've known before that through, through, you know, through reality, is, is engaged in, in crimes against humanity. So you have a dog, a dog in the game as long as you pay taxes. And so I think it's important for Americans to wake up and realize the reality, the reality in which they exist. Now, religion is not the issue. The Zionists were atheists. The Zionists were atheists. They wanted nothing to do with religion. They looked at the Orthodox Jews, and you should see what Herzl and Jabotinsky and some of these other you know, founders of Zionism, what they said about the religious Jews. You should read the kind of language they used to describe the Jews. They were atheists, so the religion is not the issue. Racism and violence is the issue, and I will say more. Prior to Zionism, prior to Zionism, Jew, the different religions that made up the, 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 you know, the mosaic of the Holy Land and the mosaic of the Middle East, you know, lived side by side. Lived side by side. Talk to, you know, talk to people who used to live, excuse me, the, the older, older Jewish population who used to live in the old city of Jerusalem next to, next to Muslims, or in Hebron next to Muslims. There was, a, there was a life of friendship and kinship in other countries and other Arab countries. So it's not a religious issue. Thank you. It's not about it's not about religion. In fact, I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I certainly think there are beautiful aspects in religion as well. So I wouldn't say that. The other thing is this. You know, somehow discounting the relig the region as worthless because of what is happening now is 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 I think is horrifying. You know, Palestine has a rich and beautiful history and a rich and beautiful culture and has contributed greatly to the cultures of the world. There's a wonderful book, there, I mean there are a lot of wonderful books, but there's a wonderful book by the Palestinian historian Nur Masalha and it's called Palestine, a 4,000 year history. Read it. You know, Palestine, and by the way, in this book he shows, as a historian, as a scientist, as a historian, as a scientist, how the name Palestine was used to describe this country going back to the days of the ancient Egyptians, and the Greeks, and the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, and on and on and on. So I mean, Palestine is a rich, beautiful country, and a country that has been marked mostly throughout history, with the exception of times when there were you know, incursions and, and, and conquests by foreigners, by tolerance. And you can talk to anybody who lived prior to 1948. And I'll tell you an interesting story. Because you bring out this issue of religion, I'll tell you an interesting story. In the year 1900, Zionism was just really just beginning, right? The year 1900. The major rabbis of the time, the major rabbis of the time published a book, Or Lei Sharim, it was, they published it in Hebrew. And basically this book was a warning to Jewish people of the dangers of Zionism and the dangers of this idea of a Jewish state. Now, like I said earlier, the, the Jewish state it contravenes Jewish law. So it has nothing to do with religion. This is a secular idea. And in this book they say basically three things. And mind you, this is pre-World War II. There are millions, they, these rabbis represented millions of Jewish people. They said, this, Jewish state, so to speak, that the Zionists want, will bring violence to the Holy Land. And we know the first acts of terrorism uh, in, in the Holy Land were by the Haganah, were by the Israeli terrorist groups, 1948, and 1924, I believe, or even before that. They said that this idea will destroy the good relations that exist between Jews and Muslims and Jews and Arabs throughout the world. There were, there were large Jewish communities in Arab countries, including Palestine, of course. And they said, this will cast doubt as to the loyalty of Jewish people 
who live around the world as as religious minorities. So are you a are you a, a member of this? Is it loyal to this country or to your country? And these three things happened. Today we look at these three things. This is the reality. This is the reality today. And so these were deeply, deeply religious rabbis who who predicted that this political secular idea is going to bring all of this violence and all of this destruction and all of this hate to the region. And they were absolutely right. So again, I, I just want to say it's not a religious or atheist issue. It's an issue, it's a political issue, it's an issue of racism, and it's an issue of settler colonialism. Um, now, who can spearhead this idea without being labeled? Nobody. There's no way, as you, I think we've seen tonight, there is no way that you can present the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian case, without being, without the minority loud, the, the you know the minority of racists and so on, attacking you for being anti-Semitic, because that's the tool they have. The problem is this: the Zionist story, compelling as it may be, is based on lies. The Palestinian story is simple; it's it's the truth. So I still think it needs to be done. And it can be done by an Israeli, it can be done by a Palestinian, it can be done jointly, it can be done by Jews, by Christians, by Muslims, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's done faithfully, and as long as it's done truthfully, and you know, above board. But it has to be done either way, and I don't think there's a way in today's atmosphere, particularly in America today, in the atmosphere that exists today, where one side is so violent, and so, and so unwilling to, to uh, no, so, so, so um, opposed to tolerance, there's no way to do it without uh, taking the risk of, of being labeled and so on. But it's a, you know, the other, the, the risk of silence I think is worse. You know, the, part, pr the price of silence is worse. Yep. Yeah, then we're done. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, excuse me. Do you, do you feel like you? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna give you. Uh, a lot of times, you know, there's this situation where everybody stands for Israel or stands for Palestine, and we forget that there's a human element to this. And the question is. How can we move forward from this? Where do we go from here? And what does that look like? Hi. I just need to say, first of all, I grieve for everyone. I grieve for the thousands of Palestinians. I grieve for the Jewish hostages. And I grieve for the people who are fighting, who are being killed in a war that should not be the way it is. However, I just want to comment that most of what I have heard you say is based in 1900, 1950. The Six Day War was 1967. I'm the mom of young adults who are committed to change, who are committed to making things happen. And I think that some of the things that you have said do not take into account the many Jewish and Palestinian groups that are working towards peace, the many young people who believe that Palestinians and Jewish people can live together. And I would encourage people here to look at both sides. If you're going to look at the Palestinian book, look at a book by Noah Tishvi about Israel. Okay, and uh, uh, one more to round it out. I don't feel like we've heard from enough women, so I'm going to grab a woman around the Thank you. Oh, I know, I know, I, rem I just remember that. Oh, that's, that's exactly the question. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'll answer. Okay. You spoke of Oslo. Um, Oslo indeed uh, gave us separate self governments for Palestinians. We have the PA in the West Bank, and we have uh, an elected Hamas as the government in Gaza. Um, Hamas is a, is a thug, a terrorist group. We had a ceasefire, essentially a ceasefire. I mean, they've been sending missiles into steroids and the Tivot practically daily, you know, every day. But we had a ceasefire on October 6th. A ceasefire now, a ceasefire now means more October 7th, more murder, more rape of Jews. Right. Miko, 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 my question, my question is, Miko, do you support 
the murder and the rape. Okay, so okay, no, we're not. We're not there. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to the question that I missed before. Uh, I think I think it was w w what to expect in Gaza in the next two, three weeks, something like that. Two months. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'm going to expand on that a little bit. And to give some context at, uh, at the risk of uh, angering a few people. And we have five minutes. And we have five minutes, so. <laughs> Answer those questions in five minutes. <laughs> The events of October 7, I think, was a watershed moment, without any question. And because we only have five minutes, I won't get into too many details. And I don't think there should be any negotiations about anything other than the, an absolute political, uh, political um, arrangement, a political agreement that will guarantee the safety and security of Palestinians. Until that is this moment right now that we see, where there's an estimated, where there's an estimated, estimated body count of 50,000 civilians at the end of a 75-year era where Palestinians have been living in terror, requires us to demand nothing less than absolute freedom absolute equality, the dismantling of the apartheid state, and an absolute uh, free Palestine from the, I mean, an absolute uh, free Palestine on all of historic Palestine. Nothing less than that. Now, the problem is, the problem is that that is never not being demanded. The problem is that all people are asking for is a ceasefire. And a ceasefire is something that Israel historically violates on a regular basis. So. I am not anticipating anything good happening in the short term unless, and as you were asking the question, <laughs> our friend here said, oh God, I don't want to hear the answer to that. Nothing good is going to happen over the next weeks, perhaps months, unless all these massive protests that we're seeing, half a million in DC and God knows how many around the world, demand the absolute end to the killing of Palestinians and the absolute guarantee to the safety and security of Palestinians. This must mean, this must mean, severe sanctions against the State of Israel. This must mean boycotts against the State of Israel. This must mean a no-fly zone over Gaza. This means severe, severe action. And the sad thing is, I don't see these demands being made anywhere. Everybody always settles when it comes to Palestinian rights, to Palestinian lives, people always settle for the little, as the minimum possible. Just pulling back what was done so that Israel can do it again. So I think there is definitely a potential right now because it was a watershed moment for everyone. And I have family, Israeli families. You know, I have a family, Israeli family, who lives in Jerusalem. And so the, I, you know, this was a watershed moment for everyone. What we do with this opportunity, I believe, depends on us because the Palestinian issue has no parent, like I said. We have to do it. I understand there's two more minutes. I'll try to, um, I'll try. You are making those demands Shut and we're going to keep on making them. I'll try to answer. Okay, you know, the gentleman in the middle who asked about, you know, you stand for Israel, you stand for Palestine. Look, you either stand for racism or you stand against racism. That's what it's about. Of course it's about people. It's all about people. It's all about people. It's all about people. It's all about people. You know how many Palestinian friends I have whose children are being kidnapped, whose fathers have been, have been, have been, have been abducted? It's about the people who are subjected to violence and racism and their right to freedom and, 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 uh, and, and rights, and equal rights. That's what this is all about, their right to freedom, their right to justice. That's what it's about, this entire conversation, this entire issue. It's not Israel-Palestine, it's about the rights of people to, uh, you know, to live, uh, to live Free. Free. And as and, and in dignity. And I think in that we are done. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Nico.